A big part of classical, or it's a better term, uh, at least what we're hearing from uh, liberal arts uh, post education, is to uh, tie things together. Uh, the point is that all knowledge is connected to all other knowledge. And that's totally opposite the way our modern progressive education goes. So modern education or progressive education is very specialized. So you study one thing, you, you go to college and you major in something and you know a lot about that one area, but you don't necessarily know much about any other area. You, you might study uh, uh, Chemistry. And you know a lot about chemistry, but you don't know much about uh, uh, history or uh, literature or art or uh, political science or any of these other areas. And even in our schools, we tend to today the subjects are taught as separate entities where. You'll, you'll study history, you'll have a history lesson, so history. and then you study literature, and you study literature, and uh, you study uh, theology, and that's another area in school. But notice we often teach them as separate entities, and, and they're not connected, because the real classical approach is to help you're studying those very same areas to see how they're all connected to each other. And that's part of the classical method, and it's hard to recover sometimes. Uh, but you know that is the best way. Say, if you're studying history, if you, you can study it kind of, OK, here are the things that happen. Here are the different presidents who served, and here are the different wars that were fought in the different centuries. And a lot of times, you it, it ends up being kind of a study of the politics of each era when you're studying history. Whereas, if you read a if you read writings by people from that period, you're getting inside the history. And you're seeing how people at that time felt, what they believed, and how they lived, and what they were like. And so, by reading the works written, you know, from in a historical period, you're really getting inside history and learning it in a much better, more thorough way. Um, and you learn that history is not just a matter of the wars that were fought or the you know, rulers or the presidents of a particular time. But every period in history is so much more. Uh, I mean, the customs and culture and the beliefs and, and, and the, the faith. Especially for us Christians, to study to see how people's faith impacted them and every other part of their life. When you read, works from the film period, you really understand that. So that's another classical method uh, to use. You, you, we hear a lot about uh, the great books approach. Well, part of that is that emphasis on primary sources that's always been a hallmark of a classical approach to, to teaching. And uh, like the first I was talking about this, ad fontes, to the fount, to the fount, to the sources. And uh, of course, uh, in Luther's time, the big example uh, was go read the primary text. Instead of reading the commentaries on Aristotle, they actually would read Aristotle. Uh, one of the examples of that said just studying the commentaries on the Bible in Luther's liberal arts 
renewal, renaissance, to go back and actually read the Bible. And so the emphasis on the Bible and the Reformation was part of this, the educational movement that was flourishing at that time. And so going to the primary sources is still a key part of classical liberal arts. And so uh, we, we hear talking about the, the great books uh, approach to read the great books of Western civilization. Well, what are they? Uh, I mean, in a way, they are some of the greatest ideas and the greatest writing and the greatest works. And uh, they're valuable to the ones that have survived the test of time. Uh, but also, it's just a way to understand the question of civilization, including the bad parts of it. Uh, these are the key works that have shaped our, our, our civilization. The idea that a good education, uh, some of the good education is with those. So anyway, as classical educators, you know, we want to, uh, to integrate knowledge. Instead of all being fragmented and broken apart, to bring it together, to relate it you all know, into a whole. And then another facet of it is uh, to do things with the primary sources. Books. The problem, though, is uh, how many of you had that kind of education? Me neither. My hand's not up either. You will notice. The thing is, none of us have had that. And now, you know, we're rediscovering this great approach, and yet none of us have had that ourselves. And we were educated under some version of the old progressive system, probably, and. Uh, and so a challenge you know, for all of us is to how do we bring this kind of education that's so powerful to our students when we haven't handled ourselves. Well, what I'm going to talk about is a resource, a curriculum that's designed not only to do the things that a really good classical education is supposed to do, namely relate all of the kinds of knowledge and tie of things together, but also uh, working with the primary sources, the great books, in order to do that. But it's designed to be used by people who, who haven't had it, had it for, for teachers, uh, but also uh, homeschoolers. So we're having a very popular resource on homeschool because it's totally self-contained, as you'll and I'm sort of self-teaching, <laughs> as, as you'll see. Um, uh, my involvement, um, the, the, it's, it's called omnibus, and omnibus is the Latin word meaning basically uh, all things, everything. <laughs> it actually doesn't try to teach everything, but it's an integrated pro, uh, uh, curriculum for literature, uh, history, uh, philosophy, theology. And it also does things with the visual arts and the musical arts. Um, and also with, with, with theology, uh, one of its features is that students in six years of this volume, they will have, have, uh, have read and in a unit and studied and talked about every book of the Bible. So it's not a substitute for a the theology curriculum or a thesis or even a Bible class. But students will study the Bible as they're studying all these other great books. Because the Bible is the greatest of the, of the great books. Uh, and it, but they actually get a good study of every single book of the Bible uh, in the course of this program. Uh, it's published by Veritas Press, which is uh, around the catalog. Uh, it's one of the main presses that supply a lot of the 
classical Christian schools. Here it's broken down, which were kindergarten, or license. Believe in kindergarten, uh, but uh, uh, But first grade, second grade. This alone will give you some good ideas, you, whether you want to use their resources or not. This is a catalog. It's not all published by them. All these resources aren't, aren't published by them, but they do, do sell them. But you wouldn't even have to you know, buy something through them. You'd probably get some good ideas and good resources for your third grade and you know geography songs uh, from around the world, things like that. So uh, maybe this would be a good resource anyway. But what they did for on the seventh grade, seventh, eighth, and ninth, they start to put together this omnibus series. In 69, it talks about, uh, I don't know that's going to seventh, seventh, seventh grade. Uh, what page? 65. 65, thank you. Oh, this one is red marks. Here, page 66. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for the whole, the whole book. Now, Omnibus 1, 2, and 3 have been out for a while. And they've proven very popular. Um, and those cover for the design, I ain't need to be used to different grades, but kind of for seventh, eighth, and ninth grades. Uh, for Omnibus 4, 5, and 6, which is now in production, or it, it's in development, it hasn't been put together yet. Uh, uh, I was asked to be one of the editors. Uh, I was not one of the editors for the first three, but I have worked on four, which is just out. Five is going to be out this fall, and six, we're starting working on it. Um, one of the complaints from our circles about Omnibus um, 1, 2, and 3 is that a lot of good material, but there's a lot of Calvinism in it. And it's true. And it's, Veritas Press is very open about their theological commitment, just like CPH is open about ours. Uh, and it's easy to avoid the, the Calvinist stuff. I'm going to get into that a little bit, or to twist it to our Lutheran advantage. Uh, but usually, when Calvinism and Lutheranism go side by side, um, and, and when our students and when our kids uh, confront Calvinism, it really makes them stronger Lutherans <laughs> because they really see how uh, Calvinism ties itself in knots and Lutheranism just, just solved them so beautifully. Uh, so even the Calvinist part, I don't think this disqualifies it, but uh, for the high school text, almost four, five, and six, yeah, they brought me in to be editor, not because I'm a Lutheran, uh, but I mean, I, I have some expertise in uh, literary history and, and things that uh, I know have, have been helpful for the series because I've been able to catch some mistakes and steer some things in a better direction. But there's definitely a, a distinct Lutheran presence in 4, 5, and 6, not only with me. Part of the job as an editor is to get people to write essays for it. And so um, uh, I was able to get uh, some Lutheran authors, such as John Morgan Montgomery, to write an essay on law. Uh, my daughter Joanna, who was here last year, a lot of you know her, uh, Joanna now Insley, uh, she. Uh, uh, She's written some of the some of the essays for us, and I'm really proud of the good job she did. Uh, this essays on Virgil that I've ever read by uh, Joanna. <laughs> anyway, um, 
And also as editor, I was able to kind of steer away some of the more blatant kind of sectarian uh, things that uh, also made this first three uh, problematic for Baptists and a lot of other theologies. So this one sort of broadens out a little bit. Uh, okay, but let me tell you how it works. Because it isn't just a textbook, it's a whole system, and it's a whole approach to teaching and tying together all of these all of these areas. Um, first of all, it starts in junior high, first three volumes, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, where does that line up according to the Tribune model of development? Okay, so in keeping in mind kind of that developmental stage where uh, kids are kind of a logical stage and they talk back and ask questions and the idea is you want to use that to what can be an obstacle to learning uh, do a little jujitsu on them and so it's actually helping them learn by encouraging them to ask questions and to find answers and to develop their minds and to analyze things. So, uh, volume uh, one is uh, Biblical and Classical Civilizations. First volume looks at the ancient world. Egyptians, Babylonians, through the uh, ancient Hebrews, and the Biblical world, your time. Especially the great works of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, volume two is page sixty-nine. Uh, Church fathers through the Reformation. There's a good study of the Church fathers, which you don't always get in kind of generic Protestant kind of uh, textbooks. And something that the Lutherans especially appreciate. So you're reading the Church Fathers, and then you're studying the writers of the Middle Ages, uh, on, all the way then through to the Reformation. And then in volume three uh, is page 72, uh, the Reformation to the present. It covers the modern era. But interesting that the Reformation is kind of hit twice, so there's some interesting overlap. Uh, but again, for us Lutherans, you know, the Reformation really is a key, a key time, and that's something we appreciate. Um, oh, but the other editors are Doug Wilson, who wrote uh, uh, the, the, the kind of foundational book for classical Christian educators. Uh, Covering law schools of learning. And he started the Association of Classical Christian Schools in Moscow, Idaho. And so he's a real kind of important figure in this, in this movement. Uh, Ty Fisher is the principal of Veritas Academy in Lancaster, which is one of the really good uh, classical Christian schools. And then, like I said, um, um, anyway, so ancient world, medieval world and the modern world, uh, volume one, two, three. Now, then for the high school level, it cycles back to cover those same periods again. So volume four is on the ancient world. Volume five is on the uh, church fathers through the Reformation. And then volume six will be on the, the modern Era. Uh, the difference, what are high school, what level is high school kids on? And, you know, rigor. And so the, these books include uh, some, some other things and kind of a different approach in teaching. Uh, so there's a lot more uh, writing that they do, uh, a lot more kind of creative activities. Uh, they'll do speeches and they'll stage trials and do kind of uh, things like that. Uh, they'll do uh, uh, 
uh, literary production, they'll study poetry or something, and then the assignment will be, all right, write a poem like this. And, uh, and, and also you know, persuading others. Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you another different set in a minute. But anyway, so the idea is you're cycling through these major periods of our history uh, in appropriate uh, ways. Um, now, everything you need to teach these books, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, is, is there for you. Now, you have to get to the separate books, the primary text. Um, as, as was said, uh, I just commented that most of these classics are online. You can just download them or just read them on your, on your iPad or, or whatever. The textbook is not a regular kind of textbook where you just read this and then you, you know it. What this is, is really a guide to the books you read. And for each one, there is an essay that basically gives the background that a student needs to know to understand this book. Um, also, leading into the issues that they need to be aware of with the book. In some cases, some um, criticism of the book, uh, and that's necessary. But it is very thorough, in some cases, some of the best things I've read on the book. Uh, as Ed said, you'll say some more things about those later. And so that's providing. And you may not know much about um, um, uh, you know, uh, the Augustine City of God. But it isn't like you have to come up in front of a class, like in a college course, and give this big lecture about it, about something that maybe you haven't even read, <laughs> you're a little study, you don't know anything about. That stuff is given here in the essays. And they're designed to be readable and stimulating to, to young kids. They always start with a big attention grabber that, that gets them into the subject. But then, the, the way it's used in teaching, you have the essay, it also then has uh, sessions, uh, the people sessions. And these are the learning activities then, that a student can work through to really understand this, this book. And there are all kinds. There are uh, discussion questions, there are Activities. Uh, there are group activities. There are uh, you know, suggestions for field trips. Uh, there are writing assignments. There are creative assignments. And you work through these sessions. And the typical one, maybe there's five sessions, depending on how long the work is, how much time you can need to spend on it. But the, the teacher and use these sessions, and it just all provided for it. Uh, and again, this is really good for homeschoolers, especially because it's also contained. Uh, um, by the way, Veritas Express also has an online program where you can go online and actually take these courses online uh, for homeschoolers, you can even do their whole program, and they're actually, uh, I guess, a, a, an accredited school, uh, accredited online school, and so you can get a, a diploma from Veritas Academy. Joanna, which we get some of you know, my daughter, uh, she's been teaching on the online program. Uh, this summer, the reason she's not here, like she was last year, she has to teach uh, on the three secondary books, and uh, that takes up her, uh, her morning. So, <laughs> but it's, it's a live interaction, it's real teaching. It's not just like a correspondence course. She's interacting with the students, she's calling on them 
online. They're having really good discussions, and, and that it's really an amazing use of technology, new technology, to have a kind of a classic purpose, and, and, and kind of classic classical pedagogy. How much does that cost? Is there like a tuition? Yeah. Yes, there's a tuition for it. Um, I don't remember what it costs, but my daughter gave me cards. I think they're still in my. She said, if anybody has any questions about any of this and how to teach it and how it works, I give them my card and they can email me. Because it reminded me to do that. I left her cards up in my. Are there other schools that do that kind of thing? Uh, there are other things online like that. I think this is the only one that does omnibus. You know, classical, too? It's the only one that does Yeah, yeah. There are all kinds of classical online really? like tutorials and resources, especially if you're doing things like. You know, Latin and uh, anyway, a lot of those are very high quality. Uh, so the, there's one particular, I uh, can't remember the name of it, find out, uh, but they use classical tutorials and it's very, very good. Um, anyway, how it works. Also, the teacher's edition comes with a CD. And that gives, in addition to the exercises, it gives uh, sample answers for the exercises. You know, what they should look like. Even the, you know, write a poem using this way, it gives that. Uh, it gives uh, tests. And so you know, it gives quizzes, it gives, you know, midterm exams, and, and all the rest of it. And again, it just makes it really, really easy to uh, to use. It's sort of a self-contained system that just about anybody can use. And, and, and in doing it, they're giving really amazing education. Um, okay, Pam, yeah. how does this work? Um, okay, look at that sheet that I, I gave you. It breaks readings into two types, primary text and secondary text. The primary text are the really key great uh, books. The secondary, though, are also really good they great books, but they're a different kind. The secondary books are lighter. They're usually more modern. They usually tie in to the same themes as the primary texts, but in a, a different way. And this series really promotes not just knowledge of the classics, but I would say kind of cultural literacy as well, because they're also reading things that you just need to, to know, like you know, Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings, and, and things like that. Um, and so, to create a balance, they'll, they'll study you know, the serious, heavy going primary text for a while, and they balance that off with something lighter and maybe more fun. Uh, but they're also digging deep into that and raising some of the same kinds of, of issues. Um, now, um, okay, well, let's, let's just go through some of these so you'll see what we're talking about. Uh, on the list one, they're reading Eskimos, the first great Hermonymous, the worst reading trilogy, Code Hammurabi, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the histories of the Herodotus, and and Greek historians, Homer's Odyssey, Plutarch's Lives, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, the history of Rome, uh, the early Roman historians, Socrates, Sophocles, uh, Antigone, Oedipus Rex, the Pope Caesar, Julius Caesar's writings. Uh, one of the things my daughter wanted me to underscore to you when you look at this is 
Lots of stuff. Three. Empty. Mm -hmm. empty. Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, if I were editor, I wouldn't. If I were editor back then, I probably would, would want something better than, than, than empty. Uh, but anyway, on this three, it'll give us the modern. Uh, Anti-Federalist Papers, the Federalist Papers, getting some good American history, American political history, plantation, Pilgrim's Progress, Social Contract, even uh, not the one on Lost, the, uh, the actual uh, Tale of Two Cities, uh, great way to study the French Revolution, uh, the Westminster Confessional today. Well, there you go. That's the calamus. You can substitute easily. Uh, but the read 1984. Great work on uh, totalitarianism. Uh, Lincoln's speeches and writings, the Communist Manifesto. And the idea is, part of the theory of it is to also read things in, in the introduction that puts it well. It says, we read. Uh, Great books, and uh, let's see. So somewhere, uh, yes, some of them we know, some of them we learn from by the problems they raise, <laughs> and so to study the book that sets forth communism, because that's an important thing to study. You know, it's about communism that is very relevant to that day as sometimes we sort of drift into socialism thinking that's a good idea. Uh, once again, people who don't know anything in history. Um, Great Gatsby, classic one there, story Mein Kampf. Okay, that's a really important to you know today. Another thing that I Uh, Edmund Burke, the functions on the revolution in France. Burke is considered the father of modern conservatism. And his work is so, uh, it's just so good, it's so, so relevant, it gives you a philosophy. And again, Burke and conservatism not necessarily the same, even as today's kind of right wing conservatism, but sometimes uh, it follows more of the liberal pattern. Uh, rather than Burke's view that talks about preserving communities, preserving uh, 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 moral, uh, uh, moral values and you know, the customs and the place of the church and all that. Burke's a great resource. These students go through this, I know, who know that. Uh, secondary. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Again, very important literary work, but it's mainly a lot of fun to, to read. And he gets the autobiography of Charles Finney. And I go, oh, that's one to skip. But my daughter is teaching the secondary but online this summer. She said, no, you got to teach uh, the autobiography of Finney. And the essay that goes along with it shows. Finney was a big uh, revivalist. And in his biography, in the, the essay that comes with it guides you through that. So you see what's wrong with this Finney and his whole approach. She said that uh, Finney, uh, of course, talks about worship. And his approach to worship is to get everybody all psyched up and manipulate them. And he tells exactly how he does it. The music builds up, and I remember the whole service to, to get them to make a decision. Decision theology. Calvinists, to their credit, they don't believe in, in decision theology you know, any more than we do. But you read things, uh, how do you see through a lot of these things? The best part of it, but what I don't know what Joanna used in the essay. Uh, it talks about um, 
in, in Western New York, a number of the people who were affected by Finney's Great Awakening, who made their decision, and of course, the point is Finney would come to a town, get a big revival, get people converted, he, he, he thought, and then he'd leave. So there's no catechesis, no church, you know, nothing. Just get them to make a decision and they're Christians and then you go along. In that western, New, one western New York town where Finney went through, a number of his converts included uh, uh, the people who started Mormonism, uh, who started Seventh-day Adventists, who started Jehovah's Witnesses, who started uh, the Oneida communities, who believed in you know, free love and communal marriage and all that, uh, now known for producing good silverware. That's uh, <laughs> what's left of the United community. And also, um, Kellogg, the guy who started Kellogg Cereal. The reason he started Kellogg Cereal was he had this whole kind of culty religion based on um, eating, eating whole grains, eating cereal. Don't eat meat, eat cereal, and it will purge you of your, of your bad qualities and uh, keep you really healthy and wholesome life. Uh, so, I mean, the point of that exercise is that that this is the fruit of, of Finneyism. When you get people all uh, some type of and, and spiritual, but don't get any doctrine, and you teach and you see how they fall off one deep end after the other. But anyway, that's it's like an inoculation. You know, the, the doctors will give will give you a shot of the germ that causes the disease, but it's a weakened version, so you can fight it off. <laughs> Uh, I think sometimes in, in our teaching, we inoculate people against some of these bad ideas like Finneyism, communism, yes. or uh, whatever uh, inoculation to make them immune from it for the rest of their lives. If you just avoid it, they come across a way, they're, oh, that's right. So they're not equipped to deal with it. Anyway, uh, I'll buy out Ben Franklin, Frankenstein, Gulliver's Travels, very important classical works, uh, but the students don't have to know that they're important classical works, they just know that they're fun to read. Um, Fox and Book of Martyrs, Pride and Prejudice, Anne Lavar, Christianity and Liberalism, uh, by, uh, let's see. Which, yeah, yeah, a reformed thinker of the 20th century, but still very relevant today. Death was Salesman, Pastor We Did Live, and Francis Schaeffer's survey, Killer Angels, Great Civil War, Historical Novel, Little Women, All Man in the Sea, Human Ways, Postmodern Times. And I wasn't even involved with it at the time when they put that together. That's a book that I wrote. A guy to contemporary culture. Yeah, you can see the really, really, very, very good and important things. And, um, and, and, and it's seasoned with a lot of other, other kinds of reading that really make it a very rich course. Each one of these is over the course of a year, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, each of these is worth. Uh, a year, and again, the program divides it up in the semester of some four year sessions. Have any of you tried using this? Uh, I, 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 I've done up through Omnibus 3. Really? Yeah, with my son. Okay. And I found that you almost have to have two books going at the same time mm -hmm. if you want to try to get through it in a year. So if you read, and oftentimes you'll see that there is a match. Uh, some of the primary, uh, pr some of the primary books kind of go along with the secondary books. Okay. Uh, True. And, and so you can uh, yeah. you can kind of follow uh, <coughs> follow that way. 
that they are related, the primary and the secondary form. Did you start in when your son was in seventh grade then? Yes. Uh, that's no, uh, I don't think so because uh, uh, we didn't. But uh, that was just because we didn't start homeschooling. He was in he was enrolled in regular school and he didn't have options. Uh, yeah, so we started in eighth grade. Really, yeah, you can some different levels. Um, now, let me show what happens with Omnibus 45. This is the second series, second time after the high school series. This is the one that I uh, do the budget helping with. Um, this is okay, the primary, okay, the Iliad, Thucydides, uh, the Bacchae, the Blaze, the Strata. Plato's Republic, uh, Aristotle, the Apocrypha, maybe you would look at, is one of the Bible texts. Uh, um, by the way, this, this list doesn't include the Bible, uh, of course, it doesn't. These are the books that, that you get through uh, this compile that I from this catalog. But in addition to those texts, you're also reading you know, Genesis and Exodus. Not in order, because uh, I think the books are kind of wind up impossible with some of the themes that are involved. Anyway, now this four, um, Euclid. So you get a little bit of uh, mathematics, geometry, one of the liberal arts, or quadrivium. Roman story about Hannibal, and the nature of things, that's uh, 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 um, Lucretius, uh, yeah, one who came up with uh, the theory of uh, atoms, that everything consists of atoms. Democritus? Democritus, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, the essay on that really gets into materialism and the problems of thinking that, like people do today, that atoms are all that really exists. Anyway, Cicero, uh, Rome, Virgil's Eclogues, Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses, Josephus, historian, he mentioned, he talks about the Jesus being born in the early church. Uh, I think Marcus Aurelius, uh, Apostolic Fathers, good introduction to the Church Fathers. Uh, secondary, you know, it's interesting, they read some fables, Luther would put those away earlier. Death on the Nile, an Anthony Christie novel. Uh, uh, but it's a good one for to be introduced to, to her. Shakespeare's, Charles Cressida, look on that. Caesar, Art of the Bible, it's a Francis Schaeffer book. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, scripture. The Lost World, that's by Brother uh, Conan Doyle. And the essay gets into some interesting things about evolution, creation, and the different views of this book is, is projecting. Knowing God, Morrissey Spro, uh, Shakespeare, and Cleopatra. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, she wrote Fantasies. And that's a, that's a book by uh, George MacDonald. That's the book that C.S. Lewis said baptized his imagination. It's, it's, it's a fairy tale, great, surreal weirdness. <laughs> and, uh, it never gets read, it seems like, in, 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 in Christian circles or in Christian schools. But, uh, it's, it's a very amazing work of the imagination, the Christian imagination. Um, mythology. Um, two Dark's Lives. Desiring God. That's why I like her. Now, in addition, these works. 
of the score and much of the high schoolers include essays on different uh, subjects, fields. The idea is that high school students learn to think about college and about vocation, about what they may want to uh, uh, focus on, and they, they want to feels they want to go into. But more than that, the idea that everybody should be aware and know about the different fields that are out there and have a Christian perspective on them. So it includes essays on um, Sound philosophy, if I have this Wilson. Um, um, an essay on politics by uh, Frank Galuza, colleague at Patrick Henry College, who were in the government program, who also was the head of the Utah Republican Party at the time of the American Senate, uh, and tells about his experiences. Um, an essay on aesthetics uh, that I wrote, actually. Can you, what, what is beauty? Can you say that one more form is better than another? What's going on with all of those aesthetic issues? Trying to open the student's eyes to all the aesthetic dimension. Focus on the true and good, but the other absolute the classical education is the beautiful. So that addresses that uh, essay on anthropology. Very influential field today. You know, this is everything is cultural. Well, we found a Christian anthropologist to write an essay. What is it that we can learn from this field? What is it? How, how, how does it work? What's a Christian take on? What can Christians uh, learn from anthropology? What are some things maybe where we draw the line? some of the claims of anthropology. Anyway, very interesting essay. Um, essay on law by John Ward Montgomery. Uh, also known the fact that that in the college of this, uh, another Missouri Senate Lutheran who's a, a key apologist. But one of those many fields is, is law. And he looks at a Christian, of what law is, and Christian perspective on law, on the legal system legal profession. Um, essay on um, I guess those are the ones, ones here. In the next one uh, I'm just find that we're working on this an essay on sports. It's a wonderful essay looking at sports and appreciating them and seeing them in terms of, 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 uh, of God and scripture. Also warning you against kind of the misuses of sports. But again, an important part of our culture today, important part of the lives of probably a lot of the young people that will be reading this. Um, but there are essays on economics, uh, on science. There's a great essay volume on the mathematics. It's the best thing I've ever read on a Christian perspective on the mathematics, the kind of the wonders of mathematics and the, the amazing things of mathematics. Uh, and it just, uh, that, oh, another really good one was on music in the next volume. You know, the best things I, I've read just talking about uh, music. And it uh, does a lot with uh, Bach and with uh, the Lutheran tradition of music. And uh, it's just a great essay. Anyway, the point is when a high school age student is working through these, they're reading the great books, they're being guided as they're, as they're working through a lot of uh, you know, very creative activities that Engage them on a good level. They're getting back, additional background, secondary reading. But they're also becoming you know, a well rounded 
well prepared person for college. So when we sit in that first anthropology class, the first uh, philosophy one on one, they're going to know exactly how to deal with it and how to, to get the most out of it, but also how as, Christian, as a Christian to kind of understand some of the problem areas they might be faced with. And a lot of philosophy one on one classes begin by trying to disprove the existence of God. <laughs> That's the classic opening. And some people just get blown away with about that. Raised in the church all their lives, but never given any training in apologetics or any understanding of the reasons to believe in Christianity. And they just get, their the first day of class sometimes, they stop going to church. That's also so strange. So, 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 a little bit of background philosophy or apologetics. You see how weak those arguments are and not how to answer them. Another good reason for, for a classical education. Well, just to finish going through uh, uh, these omnibus five, uh, Monsbury, Boethius, we've heard about. Counselors of Philosophy, Joanna wrote that one. My comedy, the rest of it, Throne Man, City of God, Introduction of Aquinas, a philosopher. Oh, St. Matthew's Passion. They, they have a CD of St. Matthew's Pet Box. Great work on uh, the, the using the text from St. Matthew, and it's a great essay accompanying it. Um, mm -hmm. Let's skip over uh, Martin Luther selects one of his writings. Yeah, I did that. I mean, balance out the wanting to the will with the freedom of a Christian. And uh, a lot of things, I, I tried to bring out a lot of Luther on vocation because I think that's a critical concept for our students to, uh, to, to learn about. And uh, anyway, they let me have a very big section for Luther. Uh, in the secondary, it, it even includes... Uh, uh, you know, went to the Great Divorce, the uh, Yankee, as the King of Koran. Uh, also, here I stand, uh, the biography of Luther and the Little Debate. Uh, I did that one also, and that also got us into some really good, uh, good discussions that you can know about. And again, we, we haven't done on the six yet. Uh, or, 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 um, let me just say a few more things. The, the textbooks, let me just pass these around. This is on the three, the last of the junior high age kids. This is on the four, the first one I worked on. It's just that. Look through it. And just page three, you'll see that they're beautiful books. I thought one is Oh, great. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, pass those around. Uh, again, they're very attractive books. Uh, they have a really good uh, designer, and who's an artist himself. And uh, so many books are just textbooks, especially if you're so great. Uh, I was studying. A good use of, of primary art. Oh, and again, also in um, the second series, in these sessions, there's almost always something usually the visual arts. So you'll read, you know, about, uh, you know, the King Arthur saga, and then there'll be a painting from that period showing King Arthur and then asking leading questions about it. So you can see how the work of art is also, how the painting is also communicating important things. So that's another uh, good feature of the second series, uh, the investment in the first three books. Um, the way they're set up, uh, the essays on each of the books includes uh, kind of an attention getter first, a section on general information about the author, 
our text, the significance, why is this book important? Uh, you know, main characters, kind of summary, setting, uh, so that it'll help students to understand what they're reading. Uh, then there's a worldview essay on each one that analyzes the worldview that's projected in the in particular work. Uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, the worldview essay is uh, uh, critical of the, of the worldview of the work. Uh, things like reading Plato and Aristotle, there's so much that's of value, and so much that is in accord with a Christian view of things, but also things in it that fall short from a, a, a biblical perspective. And so those are also brought up. And so students are learning from both in a positive way, but also they're learning critical critical analysis, and they're seeing what doesn't accord that the lens that uh, that Jacob was just talking about last night, and we're looking through you know, the lens of the scripture. Um, again, the sessions, they follow a pattern. There's a prelude, which poses just a general question about this work for, for students to, to think about, discuss. Then there are discussion sections, and these include analysis of the text, analysis of the culture, and uh, a biblical analysis. And so as we go through, you know, you understand what the text is saying, the text is what it is. And then what does this text teach us about the culture that it comes from? And then how do we bring the Bible to, to bear on this particular uh, issue. Um, and then there are the different sessions and then activities, right? Activities, uh, group activities, you know, it'll set up debates and trials and other things that are fun to do in class. Um, okay, again, issues about it. Uh, mention is too Calvinist. Uh, I do think the, the later ones, four, five, and six, will have a better balance. Uh, but again, it is good to really educate someone that they can not just be sheltered from bad ideas that they can learn how to, how to deal with them. Um, then again, as you said, you can easily such a bad what, what did you do? Well, I did have him read one of the first ones because maybe like any of you, I was kind of going through the series along with him. Uh, I, had, I didn't go through and read everything. And it's a, uh, I was staying a chapter ahead of him, so to speak. Yeah. So as we were reading through this, I started, I started noticing we're in trouble. I, I kind of figured we might be, but I hadn't read uh, Sproul on that on that book. Uh, what I did was I, I sort of did like what you were talking about with, uh, like say, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which we also did. Uh, I, I think it was I think it was helpful, especially when you start talking about high schoolers. Uh, you know, we we want to train up our children in you know the gospel of Lutheranism, of course. Uh, but then, I, I think it's very useful, as uh, Dr. Lees here pointed out, about apologetics. And I, I think that one way to do that, that we have to do that, is by reading things like chosen by God, the holiness of God. And if you can't just uh, say, well, this is bad, this is why, and then they don't ever read it. Because kids become then... Uh, skeptics, you know, a little bit. They're like, well, why wouldn't you let me read it? Yeah. It's, it's almost if, if I were if I was going through the omnibus series and I you know, I said, well, okay, we're gonna skip that. My son would say, you know, I can just see him. Yeah. I almost thought about saying, well, let's skip everything. Like, oh, okay, yeah, well, I should read that. Yeah. But it's, it's like, well, maybe there's something in there. Uh, well. So then I, I think that that was very good. And, but then I also had him read, when we read something like that, I tried to have him read something uh, to sharpen his uh, Lutheran understanding. For instance, 
something like spirituality of the cross when you read Chosen by God or Holiness of God, or when you read the Westminster Confession of Faith, maybe pick out certain things and then uh, certain articles of faith and then have them read those articles of faith, the same articles of faith in the Oxford Confession and the Anthropology, and then have it, okay, what's what's the bottom line here? What's, what's happening? To, to help Really, I think that really helps sharpen Lutheranism when you, when you greet them against each other like that. Another issue that some people have with this uh, is that uh, it does include things that most, a lot of the other kind of Christian publishers shy away from. I mean, there will be nudity in the art that they show. And some go, so this big statue here. Well, but so if people are bothered with that, they they reject it. Also, some of the works they read, they it's not censored and made nice, nice. Nineteen eighty four. What? Nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Some of the Chaucer has sort of body tales, and now there's nothing. Uh, I don't think it's pornographic in that sense, but it doesn't. Oh, the Twelve Caesars. <laughs> <laughs> the Twelve Caesars is pretty. Uh, well, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My, my daughter Joanna uh, said if she's using it for her test, she doesn't think they really need to read uh, Su- uh, Suetonius uh, talking about Roman orgies and all of that stuff. So, uh, yeah. So she said. You know, you, you could be selective or judicious, uh, but I mean, to me, that's that's kind of a. Even as the editor, I I know because I mean, we really we really want the kids to read this and we talk about it and uh, discuss it and. Um, so again, we don't. I don't think there's anything that would be necessarily corrupting, but it may open our eyes to things that. Maybe wouldn't want their eyes to be open to, but in our culture today, they're they're they're, they're, they're having to deal with it. And uh, usually, the essays do offer that that critique and, and show where it leads. And uh, so, it's somewhat protective of, of, of our kids, but it uh, again, it doesn't have shelter. Further to be educated means. Kind of sophisticated in the ways, ways of the world, and you know, rejecting certain things, but not uh, hidden from it. Which I you say often just makes it more attractive. So, again, if you're using the end in a class or, or with your kids, you can sort of go a little bit ahead and uh, you know, read some or some of the other things. Uh, but it's drinks. I've had students. At college level, who told me that they worked through the uh, omnibus series and they are really well prepared for anything the college can throw at them. I mean, it really is very high level learning. Uh, it's an amazing background and it really pays off uh, academically, but also, I think, intellectually, because they learn how to analyze, they learn how to read. Closely and critically, but also appreciatively for them. Um, and they come out with a really wide and deep education, such as the kind I wish that I had uh, when I was their age. But kind of working through omnibus, uh, if you work, like you said, like you work with it through your, your kids, you're getting it also. Yeah. Okay, well, good. Anyway, that's uh, that, that's a, that's a that's a curriculum for you. Uh, any questions or comments about it? One thing I'm glad to hear. I I, I think that this could be uh, more comprehensive uh, humanities type program if we, you know, you said you mentioned you mentioned including art. Yes. Uh, yes. But I also to, to pick up. Because there is a timeline that goes along. You, you can teach this sort of as a history, okay? 
you, the teacher has to really be maybe driving the timeline. But it follows kind of the historical pattern from you know from the early early on. But then to bring in some of the music, I think the art. I, think I like the art idea, but to bring in now music that was going on at the same time to see because. Really, I think that we see that all of these things are are interwoven: the art, the music, and the yeah. and the writings. Uh, all of these all went went together, and the same themes and uh, that were going on, the same uh, cultural ideas that were going on, drove all of these things. And I think to see their all their expressions yeah. uh, in a single course would be very helpful. Oh yeah. I mean, for example, you, you, you listen to Bach, the Baroque style, and then read John Milton, he's writing poetry in the Baroque style. And you can see exactly the connection. And then look at uh, uh, Rubens or Raphael, they're painting in the Baroque style. And what you know is that it just all comes together and they help, under, each one helps you to understand the other forms. So yeah, just as a as a learning model, I don't think there's any question. I don't even think the progressive educators would deny that these kind of interdisciplinary approaches are really educationally very, very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we went out to visit St. John's College, the um, the guide um, was talking to us about her, her classwork. Junior time, she um, she said she in, in, in high school she hated mathematics, mm -hmm. and she said that, that year she had been, they had read Newton, and and now mathematics as she read the calculus, she came to really like it. And one of the things that I see in mathematics that is extraordinary, almost in all the curricula, is that there's no connection to how this and why it actually came to be. I see you have like uh, Euclid here, uh -huh. uh, but you know, I was just wondering if anybody's ever thinking about well, having more of a historical. That's what needs to happen. Like I've said, we neglected the quadrivia. Mm -hmm. And the, next, the book that really needs to be written, I would encourage uh, one of the to write this, is a classical approach to mathematics because there, there is not, uh, I mean, there, there traditional ways to do it, you know, Saxon math or whatever, and you know, nothing against it. But that study math in isolation. And the whole point of the quadrivium, uh, one of the things that you read in there, uh, in, in this next book, or in the point five, is a piece by Boethius, who, as was said, really systematized the seven liberal arts the, into the trivium and the quadrivium. Uh, we're talking about using trivium in different ways as, a, as the basic kind of grammar school level. But um, the trivium is like the quadrivium, but how Boethius explained it. Okay, well, arithmetic is numbers, is the study of numbers. Uh, uh, music. Is the study of numbers, is numbers in time, in harmonies and portions of the numbers in time. Uh, geometry is numbers in space, and things like drawing, topography, it's all it's numbers in space. And astronomy is numbers in space and time. So in studying the movement of the heavens and calculating eclipses, is And the essay we have on mathematics makes that connection between uh, math and aesthetics and uh, kind of the reality of the, the, the goddess made. Uh, but again, there's no math curriculum that, that does that. And yeah, again, you can teach math by reading primary sources. Read uh, Euclid, read Newton, you study calculus. And I, I don't know how to do it myself, but I just feel that that's what's needed next. 
because so many like, yeah. yeah so. I wanted to comment a little bit on statistical inference. Because, <laughs> okay. you know, when you, you read through things, and, and sometimes it'll say, you know, this is from a public school experience, but I was teaching the children a, a, a novel, and it said it took them X number of days to walk for more salt. And, and I tried to explain, but I'll think of the, think of the, the terrain and, and the time to walk from Warsaw, how far could they have gone? Uh, you know, so it's, it's a math type question embedded yeah. in it. But I think they, you know, the, the fact that people are, or people aren't trained, let's say students haven't been trained to do that, and I think that some people, come on myself, it just comes naturally. You know, as soon as I hear the numbers, I just start calculating. You know, it, does this make sense? Does this fit the story? Is this possible? Plausible. So, and, and you know from my comments on your blog, but yeah. <laughs> um, I, I found this in a, in a discussion um, with some people. Uh, a report was written, signed by numerous um, uh, retired generals and uh, servicemen, and then published and, and put out there as an advocacy paper. And they cite as their basis, um, uh, if you do this, you're going to get this. Have, if you have this uh, pre -K, publicly funded pre-K, you're going to get this result. And they include tables at the end of their report that have absolutely no correlation. Mm -hmm. And just by eyeballing the tables, you can see it. And if you actually run the correlations on the tables, you realize that um, it's actually negatively correlated at you know, statistically insignificant. So basically no correlation. And you think, these people sign their names to a document and didn't have the reading ability, or didn't read it, I don't know, and didn't have the statistical inference to look at it and say, this is baseless. Oh, see, it's so important because all the studies that come out showing this thing or that thing, that's what drives political discourses, policy decisions. And you're saying that actually, if you know what you're doing, they don't they do that at all. They didn't even flip over to page seven where they give you the chart with the bars and the numbers and you can see that there's nothing there. But in politics, you sign it first, and they fill in the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. you're sad. Yeah. <laughs> you're sad. But 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 you're sad. And really, there's an, it's completely based on that. That's just the most maddening thing in the world. Like if we have an educated population, would you would think these generals would be educated? At that level? Yeah, yeah. yeah, statistics is something that an educated person needs to know these days. I believe that I was up to later in grad school. But yeah. Okay, well, our time is up. <laughs>